friends, you will all agree when I say that we are living in times that are very unlike any other period of human history. Human history has passed through many, many periods of uh, stress. But there is one thing that makes our times quite different from those periods. And that is the sudden and rapid increase of knowledge or the so-called information boom. It's ironical, but the very thing that is supposed to aid human progress threatens to become a hindrance to it, to it even a danger. In earlier periods of social stress, people at least had some faith in certain long-standing ethical and religious principles. And that faith gave them the strength to stand the strain patiently. But during the last century, that faith was badly shaken by scientific knowledge, which challenged all established religious forms, traditions, doctrines. And the result was that doctrines, dogmas, and institutions of so-called religion all lost their end. No thinking or intelligent person nowadays uh, takes them seriously until the rationality behind them is clearly explained. But that is not a bad thing after all because the scientific research, uh, the scientific temper has brought the essential or the central truths of religion and uh, spirituality in focus. Real spirituality, which is the core of religion, that has nothing to fear from any advance in scientific knowledge or historical research. At the same time, it must also be said that mere knowledge or information However vast it may be, that cannot take us too far in matters of spirituality. A person with a gigantic intellect can still be a pygmy when it comes to spirituality. As a matter of fact, this, exactly this is the problem of our times. We tend to overemphasize qualities of the head and neglect qualities of the heart. Whereas all the great masters, beginning from the Upanishadic Rishis down to Sri Ramakrishna, everybody has said uh, that in the spiritual domain, it is the pure heart alone that shows the way. So let us be warned the best book or lecture on Vedanta is still only a book or lecture about Vedanta. It is not Vedanta itself. In the end, one must not look for the substance of Vedanta in books and lectures because there is a danger of knowing too much about even Vedanta. The danger is that one may come to an understanding of it. But when Vedanta is so understood, it is no longer Vedanta, but only a theoretical duplicate of it. But still, a beginner who is not in direct contact with the living tradition of Vedanta has to turn to these sources for at least preliminary guidance. And one can only hope that these sources are faithful to their original sources and so dependent. And this is what the present speaker will very humbly try to be in these classes. I have nothing 
or little of my own to say. So all I'll be doing is repeating or paraphrasing the words of some of uh, the very great Swamis our order has produced. Now, our aim in these meetings will be to get a broad outline of the prominent features of Vedanta philosophy and of the religion that developed out of it. Usually we think that uh, Vedanta is the final, the fruit of Hinduism. It is actually the other way around. It is Hinduism that was that has developed out of Vedanta. The classes are uh, intended mainly for uh, students of Vedanta and uh, Hinduism living outside India, for busy modern people living in a Nanto religious environment. But it is also for anybody who wants a simple but uh, reliable exposition of the subject. We will try to cover, uh, cover the essentials. We will try to acquaint ourselves with all that Vedanta stands for, but that as quickly as possible. Nevertheless, we will be serving subject from a broad standpoint touching on all the fundamental doctrines of the Vedic philosophy and religion, giving equal attention to the both theoretical and the practical aspects. So anybody with a genuine interest in the universal teachings, universal tenets of uh, Vedanta and Hinduism is welcome to attend these meetings. For some, these classes will be an introduction that can very well form the basis for a more detailed future study. For some others, they will serve as a resume, a summarization of what they already know. So, so much for the introduction. Now, let us turn to the subject. Let us take up the term dharma or religion. What does Vedanta mean by dharma? The word religion, as it is commonly understood, means a system of faith and worship. Belief in the tenets of a church, I mean an established religion or a religious organization or institution. Belief in its tenets and the performance of certain rituals prescribed by it. This is, this is what is uh, commonly understood by uh, religion. And this is all that is ordinarily required of a religious person. But the term dharma has a much deeper and uh, wider meaning than the word religion. It literally means that which holds together. It comes from the Sanskrit root, through, to hold. So dharma is that which holds up the existence of a thing. It means the inmost constitution of a thing. It is the very constitution of a thing. The law of its inner being. It sustains it and helps its growth and without which the thing ceases to exist. Everything in nature has its dharma because everything must depend on something for its existence. And what is it on which the existence of a thing mainly depends? It is its own essential nature without which it can never exist. Therefore, the essential nature of a thing, that is called dharma. For example, the, uh, 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 let me give you 
some uh, everyday examples. The quality of blowing, that is the dharma of wind, the power of burning is the dharma of fire, the fluidity of water, that is its dharma. In the same way, we human beings also have an essential nature that upholds our existence and distinguishes us from the rest of creation. That is the dharma of us human beings. It is called Manava Dharma. Now, you have heard it said that according to Vedanta, human being, a human being is essentially divine. So, is it possible for us to become divine? But here, it is not a question of becoming. It is a matter of realizing that we already are divine. Divinity is already within us. The Upanishads teach that God is present everywhere. He is also in our hearts. We are divine by nature. But this divinity lies buried deep within. We don't perceive it because our mind is unclean and this unclean mind stands in the way. Just as we can't uh, see light through a dirty window, in the same way, we can't see God as long as our mind is unclean. Although all the while, He is within us and everywhere about us. If we want light, we have to clean the window. So if we want to perceive, and not only perceive, but to manifest this divinity in us, then we have to cleanse our minds. We have heard of the group of uh, six enemies. In Sanskrit, uh, their, uh, the group is called Arishadvarga, of the Shadripos, the six enemies of spiritual life. Our enemies are not outside, our real enemies. They reside in our own heart. Lust and anger, greed and delusion, pride and envy. It is these inner impurities that obscure the divine rules. As long as these dominate our mind, we can't help making errors of judgment. We commit blunders at almost every step of our life, behaving exactly like brutes. Because of our egotism, ahankara, because of our selfishness, mamakara, this feeling of I, me, and mine, we bring misery upon ourselves and upon ours. And it is due to these impurities that in the beginning, we appear to stand on the same level as brutes. We are no different, or so it appears. But fortunately, we are not brutes. Why? Because we have something, we have been given a very special gift. We can work up our way to divinity, which the brutes cannot. As human beings, we are born with the power of eliminating these impurities of the mind. We are born with the power to become God-like. And this unique inborn capacity to rise from the brute level to the divine, this precisely is our Manava Dharma. Those who indulge in a brutish life, they haven't really emerged as human beings yet. They are only animals in human form. That is what an old Sanskrit verse says. Whereas those who struggle and conquer the inner enemies and who are able to express this divinity within, in their, not only in their words, but in their character and conduct, they are the real human beings. They are real the gods in human form. Of course, 
to bring out this divinity in us is not uh, an easy job to bring it out fully it's a long hard road to a far away destination and the journey is anything but comfortable but it is also a fact that every little advancement on the path of dharma brings its own reward as we become purer and purer we also grow wiser and stronger and we will be able to discover and enjoy higher and higher forms of happiness and joy all this will inspire us to keep moving forward steadily growing in wisdom and strength increasing our inner joy but as i said it's a long process and it spans innumerable lifetimes not one or two births it's a process that goes from birth to birth until the heart becomes absolutely pure so it is then that one has a direct experience of god and the heart becomes completely pure one is even said to see god face to face can even become one with god according to vedanta it is then that a human being really becomes perfect in other words when the divinity that has all along been hidden within manifests itself fully in one's life then one is said to have attained to one's fullest stage as a human being that means if we become god like then we would have become really human we come across uh, descriptions of such knowers of god liberated souls jeevan muktas the scriptures uh talk about them. they are truly divine in every sense of the word full of wisdom joy love and compassion they have risen above nature and become absolutely free nothing can bind them nothing can shake them nothing can upset their peace of mind and no wants and because they have no wants they have no worries no fear no cause for grief they are always beaming with joy and their conduct shows that they are men and women of god they conduct their love is selfless they love one and all equally their love flows alike to everybody and their mere touch imparts purity and strength to, to those who come in contact with them that is the power of their spirituality and suffering souls find comfort and consolation this these great souls who have reached reach the goal of human life and swami vivekananda says it is only when you reach that stage you can be said to be truly religious now our world has seen many many such perfected souls in different lands and in different times and a blessing to the human race after experiencing god their hearts were full and they wanted to share their experience with others they didn't want to keep it to themselves and they talked about what they had seen and felt they taught everybody who came to them showing them the path that had led them to god and it is the these descriptions of a completely different world that uh, make up the bulk of the world's religions 
But then, these illumined souls discover different methods of self-purification, different ways of cleansing the mind. The methods may vary in uh, minor details, but the main teachings, they are all essentially alike. All the great religions of the world lead their followers alike to the same goal. They all lead to perfection, provided they are followed sincerely and faithfully. Each one of them is a correct and valid path to the divine. This is how Vedanta regards all religions. According to the Vedantic view, there is nothing wrong with the religions as they were originally taught, as they were taught by incarnations, prophets and uh, other great sages. The original teachings are precious. In fact, they are our uh, real treasure. It is they that give us the correct and sure lead. So, these are the true religions of the world. But unfortunately, what passes as a uh, religion in the world, that usually contains more chaff than grain. The spirit of the original teachings is uh, buried under a heap of dogmas that, uh, that make no sense to an intelligent person. Now, how does this happen? What began so gloriously with such a, such a, a purity of motive, how does that get uh, so degenerate? It happens because Shankaracharya points out in his uh, uh, introduction to in the introduction to his commentary of the Bhagavad Gita. It happens because those who assume the position of teachers of religion are often hardly qualified for the task. They don't alone have any insight into spiritual matters. They are quite ignorant of the true meaning and spirit of the original teachings. And when such people take upon themselves the responsibility of explaining religion to others, they make a mess of the whole thing. This is how religion degenerates into a mere creed. It becomes just a set of uh, true dogmas. And matters become worse when these teachers are also hypocritical, impure, immoral, selfish. Naturally, followers of such religious leaders become fanatical, violent, and in the end, religion, for no fault of its, religion becomes a cause of communal harmony. Instead of making use of religion for self-purification, people break one another's heads, and this is called religion. Naturally, such, a, such crudity shocks the more sensible ones in society. But they rush to the other extreme of giving up religion altogether. They go to the extreme of renouncing religion itself. It's such a pity. But for all that, there are always some thoughtful, intelligent people who can think things out, who cannot be deceived who can see through the game. These people, sooner or later, they find out that the violent and vulgar religion, uh, vulgar things that happen in the name of religion, that is all due to the ignorance and hypocrisy of the so-called leaders. All the dirt lies just on the surface because these people never are able to penetrate 
And below the dirty surface lies the treasure. It is just waiting to be taken. And this is just what the religion of Vedanta helps us do. It shows us clearly how to distinguish the real thing from the crude stuff. How to separate gold from the gold. So students of Vedanta are always encouraged to get religion directly from the source, from the original teachings of the sages and prophets. If these teachings require interpretation, then who will give it? According to Vedanta and in Hinduism, that new interpretation has to come from another sage and not from anybody else. Uh, anybody else. None less than a, a prophet or an incarnation of God will do. So, if we keep these things in mind and if we take the trouble, the pains to go to the source, there we will see how immensely practical religion is because these people are called realized souls because they have actualized, they have really experienced what they have, what they are talking about. So if we want to rise to our uh, full human stage, then we will have to begin with cleansing our hearts. That is precisely the task before us. Simply to count oneself a Hindu or a Buddhist or a Christian or a Muslim, that is nothing. Or just to subscribe to the views of an institution or an organization that is well known, hmm? give allegiance to it. That is also not enough. Vedanta says, Vedanta goes to the extent of saying that nor is it enough you have to be very learned in the scriptures themselves. But one has to put into practice the great teachings and live one's life accordingly. Only this can rouse, only this hard work, this can rouse the sleeping divinity within. To wake up that divinity and to bring it out fully is not easy, as I said. It involves very great hardship and one must be ready for sustained struggle, be willing to sacrifice a lot. But this is the only way we can achieve the highest aim of human life, attainment of dharma, our dharma, of our true nature. And this is what dharma, our religion, is all about. Swami Vivekananda defines uh, gives two definitions of religion. In some places he says, religion, mm -hmm. uh, I was mentioning uh, two statements uh, of Swami about religion. One is, religion is realization, that means it is not a theory, something immensely practical and the second one is on the practical level what consists of this practice that is mainly renunciation so now we see why religion is called dharma the primary and the secondary meanings of the word are so closely interrelated religion is that which enables us to realize our true dharma. Just as the word yoga means both the state of yoga and the method of achieving that state, the word dharma stands for both our essential nature and the means of realizing. One and the same word signifies both the goal and the way. So now, let us sum up what we have learned in this class. It's 
about, it can be summed up in about uh, half a dozen points. One, everything in creation is essentially divine. Two, to discover this divinity within and manifest it fully is possible only in a human and it is this unique capacity that distinguishes humans from the rest of creation. Therefore, number three, the realization of this latent divinity is the highest aim of human life. And four, those who succeed in this task and reach the goal become perfect in every sense. Five, here we come to uh, the wider aspects of uh, dharma. Huh? Only such souls can show others the way to that blessed goal and what they did. That is religion. That being the case, number six, all great religions are equally true. That is to say, they are all correct and valid paths to the divine. And uh, seven, religion is not theory, but immensely practical. But to discover this fact, we have to go to the original masters. And eight, to work hard to actualize our unique human potential. That is our highest duty as human beings. That is our dharma. So these are some of the fundamental teachings of the of the religion of Vedanta. From these, from these, what we uh, just heard now, we get a general idea of what Vedanta means by dharma or religion. And in the classes that follow, we will be knowing more and more about the interrelationship between the two. So now, there is uh, some 15-20 minutes uh, left for uh, some interaction. If uh, anybody wants to contribute to this class by way of opinion or comment or has a question, you're all welcome. Can I hear you? You want to ask a question? Huh? Mm -hmm. uh, please, please uh, unmute your uh, microphones. Otherwise, you may be talking and I can't hear. So, um, what is that? and then we can conclude the class and go to the day.